Good morning, Randolph Street family. This is a few minutes earlier than what we've been doing, and so we're kind of working back in in phases. We'll be doing our training hour today. I trust that you have enjoyed your time in the scriptures this week. Uh, we're going to be looking at a couple of psalms that have been uh, given to us. We're trying to do some corporate readings just to keep our own hearts uh, on the same page as we think through uh, just continuing on, striving for that unity that we have only through Christ. The songs of lament are excellent, excellent psalms, and particularly uh, necessary that we have a good understanding of why God has given those. I'd like to read kind of a lengthy um, quote from a book that was a great help to me. It's a recent uh, publication. It's entitled Dark clouds deep mercy and then the subtitle I think is a very interesting it really kind of gives the core premise of the book and I think is a good explanation for us today to understand why God has given and recorded the songs of lament it says discovering the grace of lament we wouldn't necessarily think about putting those two words together grace and lament and yet it is a gift of from God. Let me read from this. The author is Mark, and I'm not sure how you pronounce that last name, V-R-O-E-G-O-P, Vrogrop, or something like that. But let me read this. Again, it's long, but pay close attention if you can. I think it will be helpful to you. It was very helpful to me. When circumstances of life create dark clouds, I hope you'll come to embrace lament as a divinely given liturgy leading you to mercy. The use of the term liturgy I think here is interesting because the Psalms are songs and often they are expressed in times of worship, of coming and giving worship to God. Songs of lament are a liturgy leading to mercy, dark clouds, deep mercy. His historic song gives you permission to vocalize your pain as it moves you toward God-centered worship and trust. He's speaking here of a, a portion of a song written in Lamentation chapter 3. But all songs of lament are like this. This historic song gives you permission to vocalize your pain as it moves you toward God-centered worship and trust. Lament is how you live between the poles of a hard life and trusting in God's sovereignty. Excellent, excellent thought here. I know as I have been gone, as I have gone through deep times of, of struggle and lament and grief and sorrow of soul, it was so helpful for me to read these and recognize that God was using them to lead me to a place of trusting in his sovereignty. Lament is how we bring our sorrow to God. Without lament, we won't know how to process pain. Silence, bitterness, and even anger can dominate our spiritual lives instead. Without lament, we won't know how to help people walking through sorrow. Instead, we offer trite solutions, unhelpful comments, or impatient responses. What's more, without this sacred song of sorrow, we'll miss the lessons historic laments are intended to teach us. Lament is how Christians grieve. It is how to help hurting people. Lament is how we learn important truths about God and our world. My personal and pastoral experience has convinced me that biblical lament is not only a gift, but also a neglected dimension of the Christian life for many 21st century Christians. A broken world and an increasingly hostile culture makes contemporary Christianity unbalanced and limited in hope if we, hope we offer if we neglect this minor key Song, these songs of lament. We need to recover the ancient practice of lament and the grace that comes through it. Christianity suffers when lament is missing. Just excellent, excellent insight. I know that's a lot of thought. 
if you can capture the truth that is there, I think it will open up to us why these songs of lament are so important for the believer as we think about our relationship with God. Sometimes we somehow miss the truth that God is sovereign and knows all things. We tend to go through times of struggle in the sense that we're going to hide that from God like we try to hide it from others, like we try to put a face over it, like we try to put a facade over it to hide what's really behind it. God knows it is there, and it's important that we learn how to express our grief, our sorrow, our, our times of deep discouragement, depression, as we bring those to the Lord. The songs of lament are all through the scriptures. Jason has identified several to us this week. Psalms 3, 7, 17, 42 through 44, 74, and 90. What I'm hopeful to do today is to come and see some common ingredients in these psalms. If you have your scriptures with you, I would encourage you to take them out, look at them, and let's just find some common ingredients in this. I felt like of all the psalms, probably the best descriptor was found in chapter Psalm 44 and 25. It says, For our soul is bowed down to the dust our belly clings to the ground that's about as low as you can get if you're writing a song if you're trying to express the condition of your heart the condition of your soul the condition of your life at this point in time what more descriptive way could you choose than these words our soul is bowed down to the dust and our belly clings to the ground the Psalms of Lament are so deeply personal in nature. They describe things, and that's why we can relate to them. It seems like so often as we read them, we say, wow, that just that's a reflection of my own heart. And they are personal. They use so many personal pronouns as you walk through them. If you take some time and walk through Psalm 42 and 43, the Psalms directly assigned to meditate on this week. I'm sure you've discovered you, you, it would be difficult not to notice this uh, with any amount of, uh, of looking at them and this sense that it is I and we and my and, and the psalmist just over and again speaks in such a personal nature and then it's just this direct relationship between this individual writing and God himself you God and and God is it's not in a third person sense but it's very much in a very real one-on-one -on -one conversation extremely personal pulling back to see the reality of the soul it, it, I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is as children of God to learn to live in a very real relationship with him to be able to speak directly to him to address him not in a way that brings God down not using language that would sense that God is not God but language that would clearly reveal that we have an ongoing daily honest relationship with God that in the midst of struggle, we are able to come to him and identify before him. One of the things that I've learned, I've learned many things from my wife through our years of, of living the Christian life together. But one of the things that I've seen in her that's been such a help to me is just how she prays and addresses God in such a very real way and expressing the things that her heart is experiencing at that point in time things sometimes that are not pretty to look at because our hearts are not always pretty to look at things that reveal struggles of heart that other people might look at as a sense of weakness and yet God knows that and God gives us strength in our weakness in our times of vulnerability God comes and places his arms around us it is important to recognize these things and be real and these songs psalms of lament is like drawing back a curtain and a revelation of our soul and we are acknowledging 
that before God. We're not telling him something he doesn't always already know, but we are simply being real and acknowledging that before God. So these psalms are very personal in nature, and we should read them that way. They remind us, as the author said just a moment ago in the quote that I read, they remind us of our fallen world that is full of sorrow from the curse. When you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and you read God's proclamation of the curse because of man's sin, it is not pleasant. It is difficult. It is distressing to think of man moving from the perfection of Eden into a sin-cursed world where there'll be pain, where there'll be sweat in our toil, where we'll work and not always see the fruit for those things, just the difficulty, that battle that we are going to have with Satan as he would attack us and try to separate us from our God. And so we see that the fallen world is full of sorrow. Life gets messy and sometimes stays messy for very long periods of time. If we cannot learn to express the sorrow, the discouragement, the disappointment, the sense of loneliness before God, then certainly there is no remedy, there is no grace that can flow into our lives. So these songs of lament become, as the author said just a moment ago, that pathway, that journey from sorrow to experiencing the mercy and restoration of God in our heart. And so songs, songs, these psalms and songs of lament become critical in our walk with the Lord. It seems like a very common ingredient is the inability in times of sorrow and discouragement, the inability to sense the presence of God. It is that sensing or feeling forsaken and rejected. Listen to the psalmist, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Every person listening me to me today who has lived any amount of time as a believer, a follower of Christ, we have experienced this very dynamic. It's a very unsettling dynamic. We know the scriptures teach us God never leaves us nor forsakes us. The scriptures teach us the ever-present, that God is omnipresent, that God is always near. There is nowhere that we could ever go to escape the presence of God. He is always there. He knows every moment that we live. He, he experiences those things with us. And yet there are times that our soul feels so forsaken. He says, will you forget me forever? The psalmist here sensed that God had just forgotten him. He, God had gone off somewhere else and was not aware of what he was going through. Psalm 42, verses 3 and 9. My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? I recently was talking to a very dear friend of mine who's going through a battle with cancer. And it's the second time that this individual has faced this battle. And they're experiencing this very dynamic, and it was very unsettling to them not to be able to sense the presence of God, not to be able to sense that God was with them. In their first time of battling cancer, they had sensed God's presence. It was such a help to them. This time, it was difficult for them to, to have that sensing, that feeling that God was there. And I spoke about the importance of some of these psalms of reading them and attaching yourselves to them and understanding that this is a journey that God's people have traveled for centuries and it is an important thing to be able to identify, to cry out to God, to let him know you are sensing this. You feel forgotten. You feel, as it says here, rejected. Psalm 43, 2. 
for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? What an awful term to use when we think about relationship with God, and yet it's the reality of where we live sometimes. We feel rejected for a variety of reasons, maybe something that we've done in our life or just that sensing of our soul that, God, you've rejected me. You're no longer on my side. I know that Paul says in Romans, if God is for me, who could be against me? But Lord, it seems like you've rejected me. The psalmist here was going through battles, sometimes battles with real physical armies, but nonetheless, they're battles, the same types of battles that we face against a real enemy, the world, Satan, whatever the case would be. And sometimes we just feel like God has set us aside. He has forgotten us, even to the point of rejecting us. Psalm 44, 9. But you have rejected us and disgraced us. It's like, God, you've let me down, and people around me recognize that, and it seems like I've been disgraced before you. Terms that when we say them, it almost feels awkward. Like, how can we ever say God had disgraced us? How can we ever say God has rejected us? He's given his son to die for us. Those two don't fit together. But that's why grief and sorrow are so difficult for the believer because we live in an environment of hope. And sometimes that hope is hard for us to lay hold of. And God has given us, it's important to understand that the songs of lament are given by God, recorded by God, men inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, just like all other scriptures, to write these things, to divulge the true nature of their soul and the walk that they're having with God. God has given us these songs to sing. To come to that point from discouragement to recognizing and trusting fully in the sovereignty of God, it is a journey from deep sorrow, dark clouds, to deep mercy. It is that point where we can bring worship to God even in the midst of very difficult times and stages in our life. Psalm 74 Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Sometimes we feel like God is angry toward us. Sometimes we sense that there must be something there. It's kind of like a relationship between a husband and a wife. You can just, even though it's not said, sometimes you feel like, are you angry at me because our relationship it's not harmonious the way it needs to be. There's not that harmony that we normally feel toward one another. There's, we sense that God must be angry. How long, he says, O oh God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it, I love this little descriptive phrase here, it's beautiful. Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. It's kind of like God has his hand in his pocket and he's not bringing it out to give us assistance and help. So these songs of lament are very personal in nature. Many times an ingredient is that in inability to recognize the author in the book spoke about not only are lament psalms critical for our own walk with the Lord, but in discipling others. When we are engaging with a brother or sister in Christ, and we are engaging with them about very difficult things, it is important that we understand the nature of lament psalms to share it with them to help them identify with other believers, to help them see that this is a form that God has given us, a grace, a gift, a wonderful gift of God to learn how to grieve as Christians, moving toward just that trusting, that complete trust in the sovereign hand of God and what he has brought into our lives. 
They remind us that it is God who will deliver. The reason we cry out to God is we know that he is the omnipotent one. We know that he is the one who will fight the battles for us. He will be like David knew, that the Lord fights the battle. And so it is critical for us in, to see in these psalms, even though we, we sense God has rejected us, that God is not near, that God has his hand in his pocket and not bringing it out to help us, yet we know that it is, it is God who is the only one who can do that, and we continue to plead with him, recognizing that through these very difficult and sometimes very dark days, days that are shrouded in clouds and shadows that keep us from seeing clearly. Psalm 44, O oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days in the days of old. Many times in the midst of these lament psalms, the writer will hearken back to the days in which they experienced just that hand of God and they will hearken back and recognize those things and rejoice in them even though right now they feel forsaken. It is the cry to God to awake. Awake, Psalm 44. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. But what an interesting part that is when we think about asking God to awake. Psalm 3, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Psalm 7, Arise, Lord, in your anger, rise up against the rage of my enemies. Psalm 17, Arise, O Lord. Psalm 44, Awake. Psalm 74, Arise. It's like sensing that God is sleeping. He's not. God never sleeps nor slumbers. But that sense that God needs to arise from this point and be able to come and defend us and show himself faithful to us. It is God who does that. It is also this sense of pleading with God. Psalm 17, Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. The psalmist says, I'm bearing my soul before you. I am being honest before you. I am recognizing what you are doing, O God. And I bring this plea. I cry to you. We plead with God. There is nothing wrong with pleading for God. It is a part of deepening our understanding of the character of God, the trustworthiness of God. Even though at that very moment you don't sense that, you know in your heart your faith has experienced it over and again, and we trust in God. We cry out, salvation belongs to the Lord. Psalm 3, you are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Psalm 13, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. Psalm 42, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God, steadfast love clinging to the covenant of your promise. So this morning, I trust that these few little reflections maybe have already been something that's landed in your heart as you have meditated and thought through these psalms this week. I trust as we move into next week, we're going to continue these songs of lament, only add another dimension, the idea of repentance, seeking forgiveness from God, lament because of something we've done in our life, and so it is important. So I trust this has been a help to you this morning. It's been good to reconnect with you. Uh, I wish you were here to have more input into the lesson. That's always a blessing to my heart. So God's blessing upon you. Continue to stay in the word and allow it to take you. Learn how to express grief and sorrow in the way that God has intended through these psalms of lament. Blessings upon you.